Australian Football Video presents Vintage Football from the Seven Sport Classics Collection. Seven's Magic Moments and the Sensational 70s. Football action to get your blood boiling. In Seven's Magic Moments, thrill to 30 minutes of unrivaled football history. From the brilliance of Baldock to the antics of Jacko. And the Sensational 70s. Highlights from one of Aussie Rule's finest decades. Magic Moments and Sensational 70s. Two magnificent Seven Sport Classics from Australian Football Video. From Australian Football Video comes the most exciting footy decade ever, the electrifying 80s. See the marks and the sparks, the tragic and the magic, the misses and the kisses, the preacher and the creature, the flyers and the messiahs, the sneaks and the cheeks, the cunning stunts and the stunning punts. See the thrills, the spills, the skills and the deals. The electrifying 80s, the perfect gift for that special footy sickness. by Green. Down it comes here again. We've got Timmy Watson. The snap for goals. It's coming around enough. It is. What a beautiful goal by Timmy Watson. That's goal number four. It's brought the Eston crowd to life. Gets it across to Watson. Now the member stand comes to life as Timmy runs the boundary. Flicks one in towards goal. It's coming back. What a goal. Watson looking for a three, but he's got the ball anyway. Short pass by Watson. Up to full forward. Danaher well fought by Bruce Gould. Who's playing a fantastic game? Watson in the meantime. Taken it by Watson. The Essendon fans roar. Watson shot at goal. There's a burner. Essendon running rings around their opponents at the moment. They're doing as they like. Watson steadies. Turns on a swimmingly bit. A long shot of goal by Watson. Is another one. Four, five goals to Watson. It is a bar. He's the darling of Bomber fans and opposition supporters alike. But away from the spotlight of football, it's here Tim Watson loves to escape. His country retreat in Gippsland, where he relaxes with his wife Susie and family. A country boy from birth, the bush provides a great escape from the pressures of AFL football. The boy from Dimboola has found his place in the country, on the banks of Lake Glen Maggie. In my whole football career, what I wanted to get out of football was... Um, uh, somewhere to, you know, like a farm or somewhere in the country because I'd enjoyed my life, um, my growing up years in the country and I wanted to have a family, I wanted to have a big family and I wanted to have my children enjoy the country life as well and I suppose, um, you know, when you're sort of playing football and you're making money as a young fellow, you're sort of trying to decide what to do with your money and that's one of the things I wanted to do and it's been a great thing because um, we often get down here and spend you know, good, good quality family time together. And we're away from everything, we're away from people, and it's just a nice, it's just a nice, quiet, idyllic place. But go back more than 300 league games, and Tim Watson hadn't heard of Glen Maggie. He was at home in the Wimmera, honing his skills, and dreaming of the big time in the big smoke. I think that um, probably football started uh, in our house, at home, I had two older brothers, Mark and Larry, and um, you know they were obviously playing football before I was. And we used to play. I can remember playing in the hallway at home with rolled up socks, and um, in the backyard, in the front yard, out on the street. We lived across the road from the primary school too, and we used to go over there and play games uh, on the oval there, and in you know, like any space we could really find. We used to put um, the yeah. We used to put a uh, a football in a stocking and sort of practice you know jumping up and taking the marks on the on the clothesline. But actually, I had a mate who used to live around the corner, and um, we used to go to his grandmother's place. She had a uh, a garage out the back with a tiled roof, and we used to throw the ball up onto the tiled roof, and it sort of used to just sort of dribble back down. It used to hit the the guttering and then spring up, and we practiced taking speckies on each other's shoulders. So I probably tried to hone some marking skills then. Players again goes for the short pass and a magnificent mark comes out toward Watson with side bottoms there. Watson, a great mark. And then it was the pull forward zone. Watson's got the mark. I think one of the things that always helped my football development was the fact that I played a lot of football in older age groups all the way through my junior years. So I never really played in a competition that I was a standout type player. 
um, when I played school football, you know, I, was, I think I was in grade three or grade four and I was in the grade sort of five and six team. And then I went into high school and I was in grade one, in form one, and I played in the senior football team. So there was always others that were better and physically bigger and stronger and more developed than what I was. And um, in hindsight, I, look, it was nothing that was ever planned, but I think in hindsight it was a great thing because it meant that um, um, you know, the interest for me was always kept by the fact that I couldn't just sort of run around and do whatever I liked. A fellow by the name of Jack Green, who was the Essendon scout up around our area, he was often at the football and um, he got to know my parents a bit. And, uh, you know, if I ever knew that he was there, even when I was 12 or 13, you know, I'd be desperate to get out onto the ground at half time, just thinking that, you know, perhaps he's sitting over there with a cup of tea and a scone and he might be watching. And, you know, perhaps that's how they pick kids to go down to play in Melbourne one day. So I think he knew our family. He'd been to our place a couple of times because Larry had already been there. And I'd played, when I was, um, when I was 13, I went across to um, New Guinea in a Victorian representative side. And, um, and then when I was 14, I played in the under 15 Victorian side. And so I played for the Wimmera. Uh, Glenn Hawker was in that team. Um, uh, Mark Dreher, who played, um, played for Collingwood and went to Adelaide. Stevie Wright, who um, played a lot of games for the Swans. And um, we played up in Sydney in that carnival. And that was really, I suppose, you know, the, at that time, all the, all, the, all the talent scouts from all the clubs were there watching that, that particular carnival. And I suppose, um, you know, Essendon became, you know, more interested or whatever after, after that carnival. I played centre half back, which was the first time in my whole my whole junior days that I ever played in the back line, and I played centre half back, and we won. We beat um, South Australia in the final by five points, and um, it was a great it was a great carnival because uh, the Victorians have always given away sort of twelve months or so in age to the other states to try and you know what they would say even up even up the competition, and so you, at fifteen and sixteen it can be an enormous difference in. You know, and physical maturity between a 15-year-old or a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old. And um, that, was a great, that was a great win. Essendon moved quickly, and it wasn't long before they were knocking on his Dimboola door with the most amazing offer to lure the 15-year-old to Melbourne. Money just didn't enter into it. And um, it was, I think, you know, they, they had to pay Dimboola a transfer fee, which, they, which was you know, very heavy. Negotiation, and um, you know your local football side is hardly likely to to make it so difficult uh, that you're not going to be able to go and play in the VFL. And apart from that, um, I at the time I'd received I think it was um, uh, when I played the Victorian side I got a uh, an Adidas football bag, a pair of socks, and um, twenty dollars to help you know with spending money up in Sydney. And which was like it's a mountain of money. I used to do. I used to do a paper round for five dollars a week. I thought, you know, twenty bucks at one time is not too bad. And um, then the following year, when I went, I went. Oh, well, the year then when I went to Essendon, then um, I got like a twenty-five dollars a week allowance money, which made me the richest kid at high school by a long way. And um, but money never entered into it. I didn't sort of even consider having a contract until I'd been there for a few years. But I mean, times were very different. You know, my parents were very concerned about where I was going to live when I, when I went to Melbourne. And I remember the night, um, you know, still very vividly, when uh, the Essendon people turned up. And they'd come to Dimboola on this Wednesday, really to, to... The season had already started. It was one week old. And they'd arrived at Dimboola to sort out, you know, the, um, uh, the transfer from the Dimboola Football Club and... Um, it was Kevin Egan, uh, Barry Keem, who was a committeeman, and Ted Fordham, who was chairman of selectors. And they called in home, and I said, "Look, I'd love to go back to Melbourne." And so I basically went and got got my, my got my bag packed, you know, all my worldly possessions, which sort of filled half a suitcase. And my mum was very concerned that I didn't have any new school shoes. So I had to buy some new school shoes before I left. But she was very concerned about the fact that, you know, where I was going to live. And uh, she wanted me to be in a sort of a safe, secure family environment. And they assured my mother that that's, what this, what, that's the case. You know, they had that all organised. And 
on this night, um, you know, the Sullivans was very big in television. This was going back a long ways. Uh, but they were, that was a big time show. And um, Tom was heading off to war and I was heading off to Melbourne to play football. And my mum was crying and I wasn't sure she was heading. She was crying because I was heading off to Melbourne to play football. Tom was heading off to the war and she's still saying, look, are you sure you've got him a good family, you know, that he's going to move into? And they said, yes, Mrs. Watson, you know, everything's done. The deal's sweet. You know, everything's under control. You don't need to worry. And so we hopped in the car, gone about two kilometres, and I said, you know, where's the little bastard going to stay? And that was my introduction to football. And I ended up staying at Barry Keane's place for the first three months. He'd recently been divorced, and um, I guess he needed the company in the you know, big house in West Ness, and a big double-storey place. And I remember walking inside thinking, oh, you know, I've just made it. Look at this. I mean, here I am in this beautiful big two-storey house, and, you know, I'm probably, there's going to be probably maids and servants and things like that, but... They never appeared. In fact, he hardly ever appeared either. And um, I was left to sort of uh, do my own washing and do my own cleaning and do my own cooking. Did you ever find out from your mother if it was in fact Tom she was crying about or was it her son leaving? No, she was in fact crying because Tom had left. <laughs> <laughs> but while Tom was going off to war, Tim was preparing for his first battle. I remember I, it was about dusk and someone from the sun came to take my photo and I put on Nestor and Jumper that I found inside and you know, did a bit of a, a jog up the hill. And um, I woke up the next morning, I was pretty nervous, and I thought, well, I'll just sort of go through the page of the papers and just see whether this photo's in there. And I started the back and turned the pages. And, you know, not a cracker, and I thought, oh, God, you know, it's not even in there. And so then I turned, the, you know, after I finished reading all the sports pages, I turned, turned over the front to see what was actually happening in the world. And there was my picture on the front page, and I thought, you know, I, if I hadn't been nervous enough at that point to actually sort of see yourself on the front, front page of the sun thinking, you know, this is a bigger deal than I actually thought it was. I mean, it's a matter of um, his priorities. He's got to get his priorities right. I think as a, as a youngster at school, he, he needs to realise that uh, his education really comes before his football because football, as you can well imagine, is a very, uh, has a very small uh, lifespan. Uh, most footballers, if they're lucky, they can play 10 years, I suppose, and uh, that's it, and they've got to look to their career. There's always something else to achieve, you know. As you play, like, I want to be part of a premiership side, and that's, that, that's I reckon, that's about the biggest thing. Every footballer aims to be as part of a premiership side. I, I can recall that when I first started, I was doing um, a trick at the time, and uh, I was expected to do a lot more um, breaking into league football than I would expect him to do. No, oh, they, they treat me part as a, part as a team, but oh, they, they joke and muck around a bit about, you know, that I go, the fact that I go to school and that sometimes, you know. Waste any time, and uh, he's looking for Watson. Watson, the first game player for Essendon today. Isn't Ironically, Tim's first senior game was against Richmond, the team he'd idolised as a kid. For Essendon, it goes out towards young Watson on the outer side of the ground. Watson Shepard... It was a lot different in atmosphere to what the reserve grade competition was. And then around the ground and you know, I saw I could sort of saw these blokes close up for the first time like um, uh, you know, Francis Burke and Kevin Sheedy and Kevin Bartlett and I sort of thought, well, you know, I'd like I'd like to get an autograph. Um, <laughs> rather than a kick, I'd rather get these guys autographs. But as the game unfolded it it just um, it was just a I suppose it was just another game and, and, and they were the opposition. Andy Wilson goes in after the ball. Can he take it away? Unable to do so at the moment. Picked up very quickly by Watson. Kicked just wide at the centre of the ground. Watson going for a hand pass. He's found Hurd. Back to Watson. Comes to Fletcher once more. He gets his kick as he's unloaded. Oh, great mark. Taken for Essendon by Watson. And so Watson had arrived at Windy Hill. Little did he know then, but he was to develop into an important link in a very special chain that was set to make its own mark on the Bombers' history. Hand pass out, oh, it's good play as Watson now breaks away from that hand pass from Stoneham. He can run in towards the goal. He can line up the goals from about 35 metres. And oh, magnificent goal by Watson. Been dangerous, but Timmy Watson's there. Watson looking for a hand pass to Carmen. That's successful, but Browning's there. Watson back again. He puts the ball down. He runs straight past Watson. From the to Watson and Watson goes in to bring up his second goal. Hurried kick back over the centre half forward position. There's Watson, he's up again. Watch this fella go. Look at him running to an open goal. He fires. This is the good one too. Right? 
Oh, that's a mark to Watson. He won't waste his time. He goes off the mark very quickly. What the sort of pace is he used to as it goes down there? A nice mark to foul and He streaks away from his opponent. He balked, fires for the goals, and that's a beautiful goal. This by there by Robbie McGee. A hand pass across from Madden to Tim Watson. Watson now makes the difference. One point. He goes for the big punch. He's done pretty well against Van der Haar. And there's Timmy Watson going for one, another one of his runs. And this fella can really move the way again by Green. Down it comes here again. Oh, God, Timmy Watson, a snap for goal. Is it coming around enough? It is. What a beautiful goal by Timmy Watson. That's goal number four. It's brought the Eston crowd to life. But it all took time. And there was plenty of heartache for the young Bombers, as Tim found out in his first final, the 1979 elimination match against Fitzroy. Here's a chance for Merrigan to put it. Fitzroy forward and a great mark. By we went into elimination final with a team that probably resembled Dad's army. I mean, the prerequisite for being a member of this side was actually you had to have a broken limb or you had to have your knee in a cast. And, um, I mean, it's little wonder we were belted in that game by Fitzroy at Waverley Park. And so that was... I can remember, I mean, I can remember the excitement of actually thinking, oh, I'm playing in the finals. And I can remember the enormous build-up in the rooms before the game. And I can remember the streamers. I can remember um, you know, the excitement on um, the comedians' faces and you know, sort of the reliving of their own careers in the day. And that was about where it, where it ended. So Bernie Quinlan from 70 metres out just about. He's going to put it up long to Beecroft or hopeful for that anyhow. No, it's gone longer than that. He's going to run through. It's gone, a goal! It is a goal. Beautifully taken aside by Robert Walls. He has all the time to straighten up. Have it was a bitter pill for Watson and his teammates to swallow. He did, however, receive some consolation, winning the first of four best and fairest awards. This will be close, I'll tell you that. How much closer do you want? But while Watson was becoming entrenched at Windy Hill, the man whose Guernsey he inherited was given his marching orders. Coach Barry Davis was dumped in favour of a cunning former Richmond back pocket by the name of Kevin Sheedy. And just as Sheedy was a no-frills player, so he was as coach. And it certainly came as a shock to the easy-going youngsters at Windy Hill. Well, with the effort that I have in mind, I'm quite sure that we won't, uh, we won't be far away from success. He turned our club around because uh, now Barry Davis was a great coach. I, I, really, you know, I really enjoyed the time he was coach and I wore, I wore his number and... I think he's felt he had a, a special interest in me as a player. But Sheeds arrived and um, he totally transformed the place from day one. He turned up in early October, which was just unheard of at our club, really, you know, because guys really didn't want to put their runners on before Christmas. You know, he had the scales out and he was weighing, having everyone weighed and all these sorts of things. And um, we were sort of thinking, you know, what's going on here? I mean, why are we being weighed? You know, it's not as if it matters if you weigh 13 stone 7 or you weigh, uh, weigh 13 stone 8 about playing football. And then he said, OK, we start training next week in October. And you can imagine how excited the players were about that prospect. And, um, and so we did. We started training five nights a week in October. And I'm talking hard training. In fact, a lot harder than what we train today. It was... Totally unscientific, but it was training and the commitment was there and he had us all, he bought us, the club had to buy us all our own football and we had to do all these sort of football exercises with our hands because, I mean, he had wanted to be a coach for a long time and he'd stored up all these ideas about how he wanted to go about his coaching career. And I think that he couldn't wait to get started and he wanted to show us everything, you know, by Christmas time. And we trained incredibly, incredibly hard up until Christmas time. It was hard, and I think it toughened us all up, and it made those that think thought that you know playing football was sort of just an extension of their country, their country days, sort of suddenly sit up and take note. And I think we all, we all sort of took it a lot more seriously from there on in. Look, I think his greatest attribute as a person is um, he's a he's a great he's a great loser. Not that he he likes to lose but he's a great loser and he's a very, very positive man. And I think that, I think that he's been, um, well, he's been lucky because our club's, our club's stuck by him too. And um, he's stuck by the club too. But what I mean is 
you know, clubs historically have, have given a coach a period of time to perform. And if they perform in that time, which he did, you know, he was, he was there, we won the premierships 84, 85. Then we went down a little bit of a spiral um, and uh, they stuck by him and we, he built it back up again and we got into the grand final in 1990. And we lost that again and then they've given him another chance after that. Now, historically, clubs have chopped coaches at those times because they thought, well, look, we didn't win it. Um, let's go out and find ourselves someone else. And a lot of those decisions have been based purely upon emotion rather than looking at it uh, clinically in the light of day and making a business assessment of, of, of the person you've got in charge. And I think our club need to be commended for that because they have kept stability within that area, which I think permeates through the rest of the club. And I think that's one of the... And I think that he's been, a, he's been adaptable, he's been able to change, um, he's been innovative... Uh, he's not really a conservative coach. I think that um, he's always looking to improve himself. Uh, he never plays. He never plays. Um, he never plays safe. I don't think he plays safe. And I think that you know that that's helped a lot of the players develop as players too. And after a long, demanding summer, it appeared Sheedy's philosophies were set to pay handsome dividends. And there was a wave of excitement that had swept through the club pre-season, we'd beaten Carlton in a practice game for the first time, and I can still remember it was at Skinner Reserve Oval um, in Sunshine, and I was injured, I broke my ankle pre-season, I was watching the game, but everybody was just totally in raptures after the game, because we'd beaten Carlton, and they were one of the strengths of the competition at that time, and so we, we entered the season proper in this um, positive frame of mind. And coming down field is Watson. A bit of weight to the situation, a left foot kick, and a goal! Good, good, good. But that positive attitude was hardly cited in the first five home and away matches. They lost every game, and things were getting desperate at Windy Hill. We weren't losing badly, but we were still losing. And, um, you know, I think what actually turned it all around was that Sheeds actually threatened to put his boots back on. I think that that all of a sudden the players thought that maybe we better start winning some games. So we went into this. And then when we started, we got this, this, you know, the winning sequence going and we won game after game. I think we had 16 in a row during the day There's series. Now for Watson and look at him go. He kicks the ball high, doesn't gather much distance. Andrews comes in, flies, grabbed by Terry Danaher. He's grabbed, he straightens up, fires. There's a go now. And he's got the mark, Watson. And can this fellow be a match winner? A lot resting on his broad shoulders at the moment. And we're about 15 and a half minutes into this last quarter. He fires, and that's a goal. At that time, the you know the the Foster's Cup series, well, I think it was the Escort Cup then, was being played um, uh, mid-season, and so you'd sort of front up for the Saturday game, then the Tuesday night game again. And uh, Waverley was in terrible condition; we'd had a really wet uh, winter, and so it was very boggy. And we went out there, and I think there was something like uh, uh, fifty or sixty thousand people at the night final. And the Eastern people have been starved of any sort of success for so long, and uh, they were out in, in numbers and. I think it was a sort of a bit of a turning point in in in, at, in the time that I was there because all of a sudden you know we won this we won this finals game and people started to believe that uh, things were changing. Fans wanting a 15 metre penalty starting to look dangerous now, Aston uh, Peter. They still can't get the goals on the board, that can they, Lou? Uh, McClure from the back, skipping over. Well, as Watson, Watson racing into goal, shoots and has put it through. Listen to the crowd. Listen to that crowd. I just think that at that time we sort of got a different attitude within the club, this winning attitude, and the fact that yeah, you know, people were talking about as being a good side, then there was still some sort of uh, you know there was still doubters out there amongst people. But all of a sudden they started to change their opinion of us because we got into this game, and even though it was a night game, it was still there's you know the stakes were still pretty high, and Carlton were very keen to beat us, and it was a it was just a great a great win out of it by Fowler, who goes with a long kick up towards full forward. Murray is there for Richmond, can't complete the mark. Here's another one to Watson, now all the ankles stand up to it. He can't hardly turn, but he's kicked it. Satori's there, ducks back, has it all knocked out of his hands. Fowler gets it across to Mahaja. Mahaja over the top to Watson, a goal coming up as Timmy Watson puts it through. 
Now it comes to McConville, onto Montgomery. Off the ground, Watson. Best player last week and shaping up again in that regard. Watson from left half forward, puts it high, looking for Van der Haar. He doesn't let him down. The hand pass to Williams, in a bit of trouble, he's lost it. Buckley can't pick it up, it's finally picked up by Timmy Watson. Side steps about three of them. Now look at the little champ go as he goes for short pass. A beautiful pass out there to Bradbury. Gets that one down to Hawker. Hawker out wide to Watson. Watson's been a star. He bounces the ball. Still got it. Fires at the goals. The long drop cut. Magnificent goal kick by Timmy Watson. Timmy got into his back. He's off like a flash here. Has a running shot at goal. Not a bad sort of a kick either. It's a goal. A magnificent goal by Watson. What a shot. Trying to get clear. The umpire's calling play on. After tasting night final success, Sheedy, Watson and co had to wait another two years for a crack at the game's greatest prize. Watson's shot, it's true, and once again isn't an answer the challenge. Grab, in goes Azad again to Watson, now Watson got a chance to score, and he shredded it through for a goal. But it's goal number two to Watson. Smith who punches it down. It's taken by Watson, the Essendon fans roar, Watson shot at goal, there's a boomer. Kick, no one can mark it, Van der Haar. Good game for Essendon today, nine marks in many positions, shoots it to Watson who plays on around McCann. The snapshot is a boomer! What a goal! player that gets the kick, it's to Bahaja, who's gone to Merritt. Merritt in turn to Neagle, who goes for a run. Essendon running rings around their opponents at the moment. They're doing as they like, Watson steadies. Turns on a swippany bit. A long shot at goal by Watson is another one. Four, five goals to Watson. It is a bar. Well, I think that whole final series was was uh, was was just very very exciting because we played Carlton in the elimination final, and that was the first victory that we'd actually had um, in the finals day series since I'd been at the club. And I think it was about the fourth or fifth time I'd been in the elimination final, and we actually won this time. So it was amazing. It was a breakthrough for the club because we were starting to be seen as this team that choked when they got to the finals. And uh, I think that that breakthrough was a significant um, turn of events in the in the history of, of the time that I was there. And then we fronted up to Fitzroy. Now Fitzroy game was very tough the next week at the MCG. It was a really really hard slogging sort of affair. They were pretty. Um, they were in pretty good form at that stage. We got past them, we got in against North Melbourne, we thrashed North Melbourne in the elimination final. And so we're still on this wave of emotion thinking, well, how, you know, how much longer is this going to go on? And, and just the fact that we'd made the grand final, the fact that we'd actually, we're going to play in the grand final was probably enough for us at that stage. We probably couldn't handle the fact that we had to then front up to the toughest game of the whole series against a hardened team like Hawthorne. And I know that um, at the start of the game, yeah, it, was, it was very emotional. I sort of lying there doing um, doing some warm-ups and doing some exercises and you know so there's guys walking through with um, you know troughs full of ice and champagne and all that type of thing which is not a great omen before you, before the game I don't think and we're doing the warm-up and then Sheed said look you know, I want the players to get out there and show solidarity I want you sort of to line up with your with your arms linked and that type of thing which I think it was like sort of waving a red rag at a bull the Hawthorne blacks are sort of looking over it sort of starting to pour the ground with their feet thinking well you know we'll just sort of give these blokes a bit of uh, a taste of what finals is all about and it wasn't it really didn't last long I mean the emotion was was great you know standing there the national anthem all the rest of it but as soon as the game started and the ball was bounced and they got off to a great start you know they kicked very quick early goals and they just, I think they intimidated us physically and we didn't really have, we didn't really have the answer at that stage. The hurt that all players felt, while painful, helped cement a tightly knit unit. A unit, however, in Kevin Sheedy's words, wasn't without its cowboys. And there's no doubt the head honcho was the flying Dutchman, Paul van der Haar. I mean, I've always loved him. He's a terrific bloke, you know, he's a very loyal uh, friend, not that we spent a lot, a lot of time together, but we have, you know, we sort of went through those early years together, and we of played. He never would have led you astray. Well, look, he tried desperately to lead me astray, but I was, I was sort of pretty boring, sort of a kid. Was I'm, I'm, it's probably not much more exciting now, but I, I actually had this idea in my mind that you know, to be a good footballer, you shouldn't drink, you shouldn't smoke, and yeah, you shouldn't swear unless absolutely necessary, and. I suppose he's, he was totally the opposite to me because he thought the more you did of all those three things, the better footballer you'd become. 
when he arrived, he was just, it was just a sensation from day one. The long blonde hair and the you know, big, tall fellow and, uh, you know, tanned. He'd been out sort of, uh, you know, working in the gardens and, you know, digging swimming pools and stuff like that. So he immediately captured the imagination of not only the Essendon people, but I think the football public in general. But he was totally, totally different than what his, his public image suggested because he really wasn't, he was still a reluctant recruit. He would only train when he thought it was absolutely necessary, which was sort of for about five minutes on a Thursday night. And he'd turn up late for the footy and he'd uh, you know, carry his jocks around his back pocket without a footy bag and uh, all those sorts of things, which was just marvellous. Shoot off and have playing One morning, on that Vander was driving Tim to the Western Oval after he, Vander, had played cards until three in the morning and was feeling just a little peckish. So we pulled into a hamburger shop um, and while I'd ordered our hamburgers for breakfast, uh, there was a pinball machine there, so we started playing that uh, while the hamburgers were getting made up. Um, and then uh, we started winning all these games, so we were eating the hamburgers and Tim's going, I'm going to be late for the game. Another man who was hardly a sprint king on the training track was rotten Ronnie Andrews. But Ronnie was rarely caught on the ground either. That, though, had nothing to do with his pace, more his lack of it. As we see Maloney pick it up, then we got to Andrews going through. I'll never forget Ron Andrews, for, not because he was one of the greatest players I've ever seen, but you know, for someone so slow, he was rarely tackled. And... Um, it's got to say something about the man. It, it has to say something about the man. It has to say something about his um, manoeuvrability and uh, his evasive skills. But I've never seen so many blokes sort of short and stride <laughs> with the appearance of someone. And Ron just had this. He's, Ron is one of like he's just a, a great bloke, Ronnie Andrews. He's just a great bloke, and he was a he was a tough, hard man. And but a real character of the game at the same time. Chance of uh, big fellow Walsh taken off the back that time by McCarthy. Hawthorne looking good at the start of this match. From the wreckage of the 83 grand final blossomed a team of rare resolve, which steamrolled its way towards another grand final. On the way, though, they had to overcome the old enemy, Hawthorne. Their first finals meeting, the second semi final. Across the centre at the moment, Folds. That was a shocking kick. Folgers kick up towards half forward. Danaher, good fist, uh, fist away by Mew. Watson, Clark. Danaher in front, can't take the mark. Madden, oh, lovely knock on to Izzard and the goal. Great play by Madden. Knocked out by Madden, grabbed here by Baker. A hand pass out to Danaher. This looks dangerous. A shot at goal. It'll be good. It'll be a goal. So there's seven points in front. McCarthy in front has it punched away from him. Essendon doing nothing wrong at the moment. Russo to DP to Domenico. He's certainly trying. DP to Domenico's kick is close. It's a goal, Bertie. Matt couldn't hold that. Danaher spins out of the pack. as a hurry shot, Watson. Oh, he's down, but he'll get the penalty, but it uh, doesn't matter. He's well in front. Robertson copped him, and he's not too sweet with this Essendon crowd. Not there as much in it anyway. I don't think it worries Watson, and I'm sure Watson will... We'll let him see what's happened. It's gone right through for a goal. But it's go Duckworth in the front pos. He goes to the punch. He's beaten Matthews there as it comes out to DP at a minute ago. A hurried shot at goal. Oh, I think he's put it through for a goal. Yes, he is. That's his fourth. And the Bombers go back into attack. Good play as he gets around Roberts and a hand pass coming out to uh, Watson. A long shot up there. Baker's got the sit coming in there as he goes after the ball again. Now he'll turn and fire. This looks dangerous. It'll be a goal. Going down that time was a little Thompson. Breaks clear, drives the ball up, and uh, Ezard's got the mark. But he's a fair distance out from goal, and Ezard's already kicked one goal. He's gone from pass, and Timmy Watson's got the mark about 45 to 50 metres out from goal directly in front. A point the difference. The kicker's on its way. It's a high one. It's a pretty good one. Now it's uh, touched on the line and scores a dead level. A goal. A goal. The game... Resting on the shoulders of Rodney as he comes in for the kick. There it there's is, the, the siren's goal, it won't matter. And there's the goal at Hawthorne of one. They go into the grand final for 1984. The final scores of the MCG. Sheedy drove us very, very hard in 84 as a team. Uh, he, he, you know, he, we trained really, really hard again, as we always had. But I just think that deep down it was just eating away at him. And um, we just attacked, we attacked the year. 
And we played them in the second semi, Hawthorne. We'd just been beaten. It was one of the, the great games probably in the history of football. And I think we all believed that if we could just get another chance at them, then, then we could probably beat them. A crowd of just under 93,000 saw the Bombers manage only five goals in the first three quarters. Their nemesis, Hawthorne, led by 23 points at three-quarter time. But the skeleton of 83 was about to be buried. And I think we all went in there at, at that three-quarter time uh, huddle, believing that we were getting on top of Hawthorne. Although we hadn't put the score on the board, we kicked fairly uh, inaccurately. And we went into the three-quarter time huddle, I think, as you said, with 23 points down. But I just think that we all sensed that we were getting on top of them during that quarter. And all we needed to do then was to kick goals. And I remember Sheeds you know, saying, look across at the other huddle. When we weren't that far apart at, at, on the MCG. And he said, look, you know, all the Hawthorne players, they're sitting down. Um, Jeans is sort of berating them. Uh, you know, we've got them on the run. And I think we all sensed that anyway. And I think we all believe that. And then he said, um, you know, uh, all we need to do is kick a quick goal after, after uh, three-quarter time and we'll be away. And, of course, Leon Baker kicked a goal, I think, in something like 15 seconds of that last quarter. And I think we just sensed that, you know, that, that, that it was our turn. And then all through that last quarter, we sort of believed that we were going to win. They're full of running. There's Weston again with a hand pass coming over to Watson. This could be another goal. It is. Oh, they're killing him. 92, Donnell knocks it on to Merritt or trying to find Merritt but Watson's there instead, they're running right away there's another one if he's accurate, I think he's dobbed it it's Essendon's flag, no doubt about it Essendon winning their first flag since 1965 74 to 98, a difference of 24 points in favour of Essendon and Hawthorne won't be winning back-to-back -back flags 24 possessions to Timmy Watson and Hawthorne really looking a tired side, Lou, aren't they? Certainly tired now, but full marks to uh, Esther. They've plugged away all day. Number 32, Timmy Watson. At the end of 84, there were whispers that this was one of the great Essendon sides. By the end of 1985, those whispers had become a roar. The baby bombers tag was gone, replaced by a ruthless combination. They did as they liked. With a hand pass over to Harvey, back to Watson. This looks dangerous over there to where's that a goal for sure. It's the full forward position, punched out that time. Oh, beautiful pick up by Watson. A snap and goal, that's not a bad one either. I think it beat you with fast back as it would go, or not a goal. And a half, a hand pass to Harvey, on to Watson. Watson towards goal, another whipper. And Watson brings up his second. And the Bombers go further ahead. Oh, waiting down beautifully was Williams. Here they go. Timmy Watson can draw the player, then fire towards goal. Oh, thank you, Timmy! Has a go now, but backing up well is Thompson, a hand pass. Coming out to Wesard on his own there at half-back. Another one coming over to uh, Nobby Clark. A long hand pass, a chance now for West if he juggles the ball, he fumbles, he can't pick it up. Oh, good hand pass, finally able to watch that centre half forward, Borks, a long shot at goal, this could be the killer, it's a beautiful kick by Watson, and a goal, magnificent play. Put on your glasses there. Are... Wood sees a kick go forward to Watson, and Tim should just about give it across to uh, Terry Danaher to goal, which is exactly what he does. And they were led by one of the game's greats. A laid-back son of a farmer from the Riverina, or as the legendary Jack Dyer would say, the Riviera, Terry Danaher, or TD. Didn't say a lot, he let his deeds do the talking. But you can bet he had a few words with Tim after this hand pass, which had its own HBA tag. It was just a terrible... It was a terrible handball, but as always, Terry was calling for the ball. I mean, he was one of the most dangerous players to play around, Terry, because he was constantly using my back as a launching pad for taking marks that he shouldn't have been going for. Even if you're playing on the half-back flank, he was likely to be down there trying to get, mark the kick out from the full back line. He tackled me once at VFL Park. I was heading towards goal in the forward pocket, and he just grabbed hold of me. The umpire blew the whistle but didn't know what to do, didn't know how, whether he should pay a free kick against me for holding the ball and then award the free kick to Terry or not. And all he said was, oh, Jesus, mate, I'm sorry. And then one day I played in the back line with him and Hawthorne were kicking goal after goal. You know, I've been shifted down the back line. He was playing centre-half back. 
And he just caught my eye as the, as the bound jump pilots was take, to taking the ball back to the centre. And he just said to me in his laconic way, gee, she's getting busy down here, isn't she, mate? <laughs> Which was the understatement of all time, but that's him. He's the guy. And I feel very fortunate. I feel very fortunate for the career I've had, but also to meet you know, some of those great... Because they're great. Not only have they been great players, like Simon is a great man, Terry's a great man. Um, Gary Folds, who also played 300 games at Essendon, is a great man too. And the Binks, I mean, there's so many others too, but I think probably one of the greatest things about our club and the stability of it as a club has been the fact that we've had these great, great men who have been great role models. I mean, you couldn't, I mean, I wouldn't want, I couldn't think of anyone better to have in a club for my son to walk into and want to emulate than Terry Danaher because... From day one, he'd have the right attitude. He'd be looking at this bloke thinking, well, you know, if that's what it takes to be as good as Terry Dano, if that's what I have to do, then that's what I'll do. Almost straight to Matt, though, and here's the danger man, Watson. An explosive speed he has, gets on his gas, and the way it goes, another goal, isn't it? And it was Danaher who led the Bombers to back-to-back -back flags. Again, it was their arch rival, but this time, in front of 100,042 fans, Hawthorne coughed a belt. Teammate Simon Matt. Nick Packer players down there, it rebounds to Watson. He has a two. Watson Hanley runs into three, four as players. Watson with brilliant play. Gets around the uh, opponent, then goes for a short pass. Over it goes to Elshaw. Back there again towards Elshaw. Kicked off the ground by O'Halloran. Coming out the middle is Watson. Shows a lot of pace, too much for Langford, goes for short pass to Merritt, and he's got the mark. No, great tackle, Kevin Walsh. Madden throws it, out to Watson. Nothing for that. Hawker, slung, ball in towards centre field. McCarthy gets it on to Schwab. Schwab's left footer up towards uh, Timmy Watson, standing there on his own, takes the easiest of uncontested marks. Number 32, vice-captain, Tim Watson. I think we had, we had then developed a great deal of confidence in each other and over the years through the recruitment uh, they put together a very good solid mix of players. I don't think, look as a player I think you always feel that even though you might be playing a lower side that you know something might go wrong and you might lose so I never felt that we were invincible. Two successive premierships and the players doing their lap of honour. Things couldn't have been better for Watson. His second grand final medallion and his second best and fairest award. While football, though, can be kind, it can be very, very cruel. After an amazing injury-free run, Tim Watson suddenly discovered how cruel it can be as he fell to a footballer's worst nightmare, a knee reconstruction. Well, you know, it was really strange because during that pre-season, I, I can remember one, one day I was running around um, you know, down, down at uh, Glen Maggie, sort of thinking about you know, how lucky I'd been throughout my career and um, you know, how I'd never had any serious injuries. And then, you know, like three games into the season, I do my knee and I'm going to be out of action for sort of a whole year. And I think, look, that was, that was a terribly low point for me. I, I was... Um, you know, I was sort of spent about 10 days in hospital and I came out and I was still in a lot of pain and I think I lost something like two and a half stone um, during that time, purely because I felt ill and I couldn't eat and, and then, but I think you still think, well, it's, it's just a matter of time before it'll, you know, I'll be right and ready to play again. And then I had sort of complications after that. So there were times when I really started to, to believe that maybe I wasn't going to get back and play. But I think that you know, after every sort of setback, there was a bit of disappointment and then there was a sort of a bit of a ray of hope and it was just a matter of doing some more rehabilitation and some more physio. Just, and then just I got started again. That, I mean, did you ever consider quitting? Oh, no, no. Look, I never considered quitting because 
I was only, um, look, I was only 24 or 25 at the time. I was just, I was still very young. I'd played a lot of football to that point, but I actually felt a bit cheated because I think as a, as a player, you play your best football sort of between probably 23 and 27. I think, you know, like as a, you, you physically, you, you, you're coping better at that stage of your career and with experience and speed and that type of thing. So I probably felt a little bit cheated that, see, I, I think I, I missed something like 36 games with my knee and different problems that I had with it. So it was really nearly, um, you know, two whole seasons of football that I stood out of. You know, at the end of 84, 85, a lot of the players were starting to think, well, you know, what now? You know, we've had, we've had great success. We've worked hard for our success, but maybe we're not as, you know, as prepared to work as hard again. And I felt that there was a sort of a, I think that the whole place became very complacent. I think that as a club, we had had a lot of success at that time. And there was sort of a bit of a, a bit of complacency about the place. And um, I thought that, I thought the danger signs were there during the pre-season, but we got off to a pretty good start. We won our first three games and then, you know, things started to go horribly wrong. Alvin there with Chris Danaher and charging onto it, Watson. And how right he was. After three successive grand finals, the Bombers battled for the next three. They did appear briefly in the finals, but the only personal high point for Watson was a third best and fairest trophy in 1988. Over the top, Clark. Jamie Turner under pressure. Great interception, Watson. Look at the dash of go. Timmy Watson inside 50. Goes long with the left foot. First goal to Westman. Oh, he's been outstanding. 14 kicks and here is 15 kick and 14 hand passes. Let's see if he can put it through. Beautiful looking kick on the left. And he has put it through. Oh, but a chance for Clark. Off he goes to Hawker. This should be an Essendon goal coming up here. Watson had to wait. Gets around Sheldon. Watson for goal and kicks it. Despite the Bombers' disappointing performance, the individual honours still came his way. State selection was a highlight, but while performing admirably at the highest level, one of Watson's great regrets was not being given a go by Victorian selectors. Well, that's one of my great disappointments, actually, that um, I missed out on state games. I, I don't think the state selectors had a very high regard for me as a player. And I know they didn't because, um, I mean, Sheeds obviously spoke to them and then, you know, he, was fairly candid about what they thought of me as a player, which really hurt me and um, I felt very disappointed in their assessment because obviously um, I thought they were wrong and um, I knew that if I was given the chance then you know, I would have been able to perform but there was times when I was left out of the side and, and not played and um, I suppose that really annoyed me but I was really, you know, I was really desperately keen. The, the last couple of times I played for the state, um, I was named in the better players, which meant, look, it meant a lot to me. It meant more than people would understand to me because, you know, as a player, you have a lot of pride and we've all got an ego and you want to get on the stage. It's a place to perform and then perform and be recognised for performing. And, um, you know, I was desperate towards, in my last two state games, I was just desperate to play for Victoria because I felt that I'd that an injustice had occurred throughout my career. Punches it away, but waiting there is Tim Watson, a hand pass to Harvey, back it'll come to Watson, this is danger for Carton. Watson while he may have thought himself hard done by by the state selectors, those in the know out at Windy Hill thought differently. Watson was appointed captain of the club, succeeding TD who completed a successful six-year stint as Sheedy's right-hand man. Watson, kick around his shoulders, <laughs> unbelievable! Leading from the front, Watson tasted finals football once again, only to stumble in the preliminary final against a rampaging Geelong. With him is Buse, past him, Watson shows pace. Great play by Tim Watson, that's the sort of thing he can do. And he shoots in towards goal, what a Three minutes left, he goes for the pass into the pocket, the bounce awkward for Bailey, it's okay for Watson, the kick by Watson's a goal! Despite that humiliation, the new skipper collected his fourth best and fairest, but he still yearned for that one moment all league captains dream of, holding aloft the Premiership Cup. And Watson's dream looked set to materialise as the 1990 season unfolded. That was until injury 
again shattered his dream. His left knee's his knee gone. His left knee's gone, Pete. Oh, he is in agony, the Essendon champion. Look, it was a fairly, it was a strange year because uh, it, was, it just felt like a different final series to us and how I, I, I sort of kept remembering back to our 84 and our 85 years and how we'd gone into those final series and we were full of enthusiasm and we were full of confidence. But this final series was just so different. We, you know, we went out to watch Collingwood play the West Coast Eagles and Peter Simic had that kick and missed the goal. And we'd already left by that time thinking that we'll get to beat the traffic, you know, because we went out as a team in the bus. And we're all sort of sitting there listening to the call of the game. And there was just this amazing feeling when the game ended in a draw that everyone just sort of sat there on the bus and nobody said anything for probably a minute or two. And then it was just disappointment knowing that, OK, we had to wait another fortnight now before we came back out and played. And there was lots of us that needed games at that time. We really didn't need to put back our, you know, our, our, camp, our finals campaign another week. And I think that we lost a lot of momentum at that point as well. Yeah, just going back and the reason why you needed those games, Sheedy did some strange things, didn't he, prior to that? I know that the, the four Danahers played, I think it was against St Kilda. A number of players were arrested. It was a somewhat different build-up towards that final series. Well, yeah, look I, look, I don't know whether or not anyone was really rested. I, I think that players might have been injured at that last game and I don't know how, look I can't, I really can't recall how serious those injuries were. I know that he was very keen to give the four Danaher brothers the chance to run out together and it was probably a great, you know, it was a great PR type coup for the club at that time and, but I don't, look, I, knowing Seeds, I don't think that he would ever, um, he would ever jeopardise the team's chances of winning finals game by doing something like that. I mean, winning means far too much to him and always has meant far too much to him. But I just think that it was just one of those final series where we just didn't, well, we probably weren't, we weren't meant to win. Go in, up over the top, Stasevich. No one can break clear. Attempt to the advantage of Dacos. Look at the gather. The right foot snap, this is a miraculous kick. Diving on the football, the Collingwood defence, trying to keep it in. Kicked by Watson. Up towards full forward. No mark. Touched away. Now kick it. Gets his right foot oh. to the ball. Oh. Miraculous goal by kick it. Can't do so. Russell picks it up. Heads in towards the pocket. Over the head of Thompson it goes. Dacos. This is where he's at his best. The master. Breaks to Shaw again. The skipper gives it to Barwick. On the Banks. Dennis Banks caught. Back to Barwick. Doug Barwick shoots and goes. Things fell into place for Collingwood. They played their best football of the year throughout that final series, and we just didn't get any. We just didn't get anything happening. And I remember the, the Thursday night before the grand final, and I just couldn't believe um, the, the the lethargic way we set about our training. And um, I called the players together and sort of spoke to them about the fact that look, you know, this is the most important game for us for the year. But it was just as if we we're just a tired unit and we couldn't muster the enthusiasm to go on which is I mean it's a remarkable thing to say I know because it is the biggest game of the year but we just look like a tired sore sorry lot of players even that in the week leading up to the grand final. The captain included I mean you had the opportunity to do something you hadn't done before and that was as captain raise a premiership cup in front of 110,000 fans how did you feel? Well I felt pretty fresh because uh, you know I'd missed a lot of that football towards the end of the year but I think that, um, yeah, I think that it was probably it was probably might have been difficult for them to handle the players because we had a lot of players that needed extra work, but we probably had a lot of players that needed a, a lesser amount of work just to freshen them up for the finals because they'd been through the whole year and done it pretty tough, and maybe we didn't handle our players as well as what we could have in, in terms of freshening them up for that final series. Sheeds asked me to meet him after the grand final in the morning uh, uh, at the old at the old Melbourne Motor in about 7.30, 8 o'clock and um, because you know, I was obviously disappointed and, um, and he said to me, look, you know, uh, you haven't, you're, not, you're not considering it retiring at this stage, are you? And I said, um, well, I don't, 
I don't think it's a great time to retire anyway after you've, but you know, I feel pretty disappointed. And he said, look, you know that if you retired now, um, you'd always be remembered as the captain of the Essendon team that lost to Collingwood in the grand final. And um, I didn't say it to him, but it was sort of going around in my mind thinking, well, you know, would that be any worse than being remembered as the coach of the team that lost to Collingwood in the grand final? Watson. Typical Watson aggression. And look at the kick. Oh, look Sandy. at that goal. The following year, the Bombers struggled to recapture their 1990 form and stumbled into the finals, but only for a very brief time. Another elimination final loss, this time against Melbourne, and the margin, 38 points. Caught by Watson, dispossessed, Hills is a chance, handball, Watson is a big chance, from 25, kicks the goal. Left-handed hand pass, down to Danaher creating some space at half forward not a long kick won't quite make the distance Somerville the big fly Cuthbertson the hand pass Watson kicks a goal uh, the numbers have been Melbourne's way and that's continuing Arshold in towards full forward and a mark taken by Lovell he has a pot shot and puts it through With the disappointing finals campaign over, so came the end of an era. Within 12 months of each other, Tim Watson and Ruckman Simon Madden decided it was time. While a reluctant Terry Danaher, who just wanted to play forever, headed back to the bush and the Wagga Tigers. I retired because uh, I lacked the motivation to keep going and playing. And I was really sore. I had, I had a lot of injuries that had been piling up over, over, over the last couple of years I played, had um, chronic sort of back, hamstring injuries. I'd had a reconstruction on my wrist. Um, I needed another one on my other wrist and I was just sore and mentally and physically. I was tired and drained and I just didn't have the motivation to keep going. See, look at that face on television. It's nearly as good as his face on I television. I don't know. As you know, one of the most important things... Yeah. While Watson was the consummate professional on the field, he tended to lapse into moments of comedy when his time came in the media, particularly television. What have you got? Well, I've got a bit of everything here. Come on. OK. The makeup lady at Channel 7 says I don't need lipstick, but I'm sure it would look better. One of his finest performances was on the ABC's Live and Sweaty. And the eyebrows have been done nicely. Are they natural or have you had them? No, I've been coming in. Yeah. I actually like that grandmother look. You like this one? Steak, you do it, you yeah, do it. Yeah, that one. You know what The grandma's... <laughs> but now back what? on television. No, I don't know why people wouldn't take me seriously. OK, and now we cross down to the boundary line. How's it going? Thank you, Sandy. Well, it's been a terribly torrid game here um, at three-quarter time. Uh, Malcolm Blight was very distressed about some of his players. He kicked me off the ground, Sandy. I've got no idea why. All I was doing was standing there trying to listen to what they were saying. Now we're all joining in the song. Timmy Watson. 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 Timmy Timmy Watson. After seeing that, it's hard to believe Tim doesn't see himself as a comedian. Now, Tim. Sam. Uh, son, I mean, I, I can't keep up with the mail about the hair. I mean, if you've ever looked more ridiculous before, you look absolutely stupid tonight. What the hell's wrong with you? Could you get the hair cut? Do my tie? Seriously. Your tie? No, your hair. Uh, you've, I think if you actually took the frown off your face and had it clipped back, mate, you might improve your actual standing. Oh. <laughs> you've done it. I'm not a comedian, I'm not, I'm not even a particularly funny person, but I think I don't take myself too seriously. And by doing those sorts of things, you're not taking yourself seriously. And I think it's, I, I think it's, um, you know, I think that's what football's got going for it, that perhaps um, tennis and some of the other sports haven't, is that we're able to, um, the people are able to see the players as they are. And we get a lot of 
we get a lot of the personality of the footballers coming across in the game itself and off the field again. Now I think that's why football enjoys a great popularity with the people is because they're actually able to um, relate to the players because of it. Well, I've really enjoyed the football show. I think that, um, look, the footy show is a little bit like Essendon last year. Um, when they started out at the commencement, they, they didn't know that it was going to be a great show or it was going to be a popular show. I suppose great and popular are, are two different um, descriptions because it's probably not a great show, but it's a very popular show. And I think that what it's done, it's, it's, probably, it's all in the timing now too. That we haven't had something like that. We've had contemporary players actually on the screen talking about the game fairly candidly too. And um, no footage, so it's meant that you've had to have the talking. And I think that that's something that people have appreciated. That they know that it's live, it's not really contrived, it's spontaneous, and they see a bit of each player's personality. It sort of takes them... I, I suppose people watch it because of the fact that it takes them behind the scenes a little bit. <laughs> While seeing another side of the game through the media, Tim was again drawn back to the game. And surprisingly, the calling came while he was at his Glen Maggie hideaway. And I started to think for the first time at that time, maybe, but I had, um, I still had a sore knee and, um, and so I thought, no, I don't really want to go and have another operation and I don't know that I want to go through getting myself fit enough to play AFL football. And we're actually down here over that summer, and it must have been in February, I'd started, already started work at um, St Kilda. Uh, well, I had agreed to start work. I hadn't actually been to their training and, um, as, a, as a skills um, helper. And um, I watched Essendon play the Brisbane Bears in a, in a Foster's Cup. And I just saw something that made me want to go back and play again. And I think it was the young talent. I mean, it was the young talent there that was at Essendon at that time. And I actually started to think about me playing again, not... And um, uh, I'd spoken to Ken Sheldon after this, and he, he was keen for me to go and play at St Kilda. And though they were, in fact, going to draft, they were going to draft me. And, um, and then the club, I spoke to the club about it too. And I didn't, I didn't know whether I wanted to go back to Essendon because I thought that I'd had such a great career there. And um, I thought that I wanted to play again, but I thought maybe... You know, maybe it'd be a great experience to actually go and play for another club and to see something new and different and experience like a whole different environment, like a club environment and different people and a new coach. And so I really, I really said to the football club, I said to Essendon that, um, that I didn't want to go back and play there and that I, wanted, I favoured going to, going to St Kilda. And, um, and then we had a meeting at um, David Shaw's place, our president, and, um, and and Sheeds was there, and and yeah, we, we hadn't really we hadn't really spoken that much since the article. And even though I didn't sort of harbour any grudges, I didn't know whether he did. And we spoke about it, and um, it, it was very interesting. He, you know, he just sort of said how you know these things happen, and um, you know he respects my point of view, and uh, you know he just said, look, as a coach, you sometimes um, you fall in love with your players. He said you fall in love with your players that you see get you through from game to game and, and you know, he spoke about those sorts of things. But I was sort of in a real dilemma because I'd given, I'd given St Kilda um, a verbal undertaking that, that I wanted to be drafted by them and I didn't want to go back on my word but deep down I was sort of even, we were down here when the draft was on the day of the draft and I was, at that stage I was unsure what was going to happen. But I wanted to go, even though I said St Kilda and I wasn't going to go back on my word, I was desperately hoping that Essendon draft because you know, they were going to have a draft pick before um, St Kilda's anyway. And as it turned out, um, you know, that, 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 um, that happened. But I suppose you know, the impetus was seeing this exciting team play, you know, like all these young players play. And it really just rekindled my enthusiasm to go back and restart. Look, I'll tell you what happened. That night that I sat down with um, Sheeds at, um, at David Shaw's place, who's the president of the Essendon Football Club, and there was Roger Hampson there. And 
you know, they were reselling the club and the talent and all the things that I'd seen for myself anyway. And she'd said to me, look, you've got a real chance. If you come back to us, there's a real chance that you'll get to play in the finals again. He said, I don't think this year, which is last year, 93. He said, but 94 or 95, this side is capable of winning a premiership. And um, they were his words. Now, he was being totally honest with me. He didn't believe at the start of the 93 season that the Essendon Football Club had the, had the, had the chance of playing in the finals. Not, not winning the grand final. He didn't actually think that they had a, had a, had a chance of making the finals. And um, so I, I started, you know, my idea was to play for the, for, you know, for the two years. But in terms of regrets, um, I was very lucky because one of the changes at Essendon was a new fitness fellow by the name of uh, Danny Corcoran. And Danny was just absolutely marvellous fellow. And I trained with him sort of twice a day for, you know, for, for a three-month period. And um, without Danny's help, I, I've no doubt that I would have, wouldn't have come back and had a successful comeback. And um, the guy knew by... I knew by coming back and playing that I was putting a reputation on the line. If Watson was worried about his reputation, he need not have been. His determination to regain peak fitness after an 18-month layoff was only matched by his desire to play again in a successful Essendon lineup. And so Watson was ready. It was a humble return through the reserves, but it was a successful return. And it was completed when the number 32 Guernsey reappeared in round eight against St Kilda. Derek kick it at the back. This could be the sealer. Kicks it goal. Essendon will win. After that, Essendon's golden roll just continued. With the Foster's Cup victory behind them, Everyone at Windy Hill was suddenly chasing the double. Can he kick the fifth goal? He steadies, and James Hurd has slammed it through for goal number five. And Tim Watson, maybe the distance I think will worry him, Robbo, just outside the 50 metre area. He'd be a chance. Kicks it high in the air. The police is going to go. The opportunity came when they marched into yet another finals campaign. Sure although things were looking shaky at half-time against the Crows in the preliminary final. Down by 42 points, the Bombers staged one of the greatest comebacks in finals football, and Watson sealed the match and a grand final berth against Carlton with some old magic. Mercury, now Watson gets around, forced to kick with the left, it slews off the side of his boot. Set a half back for Adelaide, very important possession. Watson's got it, Watson goes for goal. Graham Corn shakes his head in disbelief. I declare Gavin Wagner the 1993 Brownlow medalist. 48 hours later, young Aborigine Gavin Wanganeen walked off with the Brownlow medal, the first bomber to do so since Graham Moss in 1976. Fletcher to bring it back into play. Bomber fans may well have kept the champagne on ice because five days later it would be required again. Yes, the team that wasn't meant to go anywhere in 93 had literally cleaned up. Away goes Michael Long. 50 metres out. Still going. 30 metres out. Oh, what play. It may have been touched on the line. No. Away they go again. Hill will have to be quick. He is with a high kick up towards Somerville territory. Sandwiched between two Carlton players. Bjellek. Look at this. Ho -ho! The Bombers are hot. Excellent play there by Essendon again. Long just backs away. Have a look at oh. this. Take me on. Take me on. Take me on, he says. And still gets away with it. And pumps it to within 50 metres. Here, well inside. Away goes Chris Danaher. Have a look there. Brilliant football, Danaher. Well harassed by Ola Renshaw. 
Scholl gets his foot to it. Seminal mark. Oh, he drops it. But away goes Wang Yanin, the 1993 Brownlow medalist. It goes out the half back. It bounces beautifully for Long. Long, come and get me, Millam Hanna, he says. But Wang Yanin's run brilliantly from the back pocket. And his disposal, not quite for Hurd. Christu falls over. Hurd, handball. Wang Yanin will kick a goal. It bounces inaccurately. Maybe that could have been the play of the decade. <laughs> Who was just putting a stamp on this game, Gary O'Donnell. Quite brilliant around the centre of the ground. And another brilliant kick to the goal front. Spalding couldn't take the mark. Another goal to Essendon kicked by Hurd. It's all over. Sheer excitement. Off to Mercury. Long again. Is this man the best man on the ground? I ask you. To half forward, wing it in. He had a shot at goal. This is fitting, isn't it? This is very fitting, Robbo. The Brownlow medalist. He won the Michael Tuck medal for being the champion player in the night series at the start of the year. And now he wants to cap it off with a goal. And he has. He has. And so Watson returned triumphant, his doubters silenced, the Bombers supreme. But if coming back and winning a flag wasn't enough, Watson, like the trapeze artist without a net, decided to go again. Like 93, the Bombers didn't set the world on fire at the start of 94. But an unforgettable moment for Tim Watson and his family was celebrating his 300th game. Wife Susie, a proud spectator, as her family was honoured. It was quite a big build-up during the week, so he was, Tim was quite nervous, and the kids were really excited about running out onto the field, although I think really perhaps just Job and Billy had any understanding of what it was all about. The others were just going along for the ride. But um, it was an exciting day, and it was sort of emotional day too. I mean his mum and dad were down and his grandfather and it was really a, a lovely atmosphere <laughs> and it was lovely to see the kids all running out with him so it was really nice. Now you must have been pretty proud of him. Yeah I did feel proud yeah I thought I thought yeah he's done a lot so it was nice that it was um, it was recognised. Look it has it has been difficult but um, I not to say behind every every man there's a, a good woman and I've been very fortunate to have such a great mother and wife that Susie's been, and um, it, and she's sort of, I suppose, she's almost single-handedly brought the children up, and um, but it, it is it's difficult it's difficult to combine the two. Plus, you know, sort of having a business at the same time, but I always and I firmly believe that to be a successful sports person, then I think you have to have a fairly single-minded, selfish attitude about what you're doing. And I think that whether you do it consciously or not, your sport has to be a priority in your life. And it's not to say that you don't love your family or you don't want to spend time with your family, but you just know that if you want to be number one or you want to be better or you want to stay at the top, then you have to devote your time to what you're doing. Lots of times when you think, oh, I'm just sick of, you know, all the commitments, it's just it's just so time-consuming, the footy. But um, really we've just had to do, um, I've had to look after the family and Tim's had to go to footy and go to work, so we've just had to really try and make the most of the time we do have. I mean, in a way, at times, I guess you've been both mother and father. Yeah, well, there's lots of times when the kids wouldn't see Tim for, you know, days on end and it wouldn't worry them. <laughs> They're only human, aren't they? <laughs> so, I mean, they just get used to it, though, you know. I mean, if he was around all the time, then they'd miss him if he wasn't there, but they just know that he's not there much and that's the way it is. 1994 hasn't been easy for Watson. 
a rare visit to the tribunal and a spate of injuries have tested the resolve of the 33-year-old. Also, in the back of his mind, retirement, but this time for good. I think they might even be a little bit sad at this time because I suppose even though I retired, I never thought I was going to play again. I probably deep down felt that if I wanted to, I was going to be young enough to go back and play again. Whereas this time I know that it, it will be the end, of the, the end of the line. And look, I, it's, it's, not only, it's not only giving up the number 32, it's, it's the fact that you know, at 15 years of age, the Essendon Football Club became my home. And probably I feel as comfortable within the confines of the Essendon Football Club as I do anywhere in the world. And I think giving up that part of your life, knowing that it's, it's, it's a stage or a part of your life that you can't relive again, I think, that, I think that's the, the sadness of being involved in a football club, walking out again and just sort of going on and sort of and probably pursuing a normal life. Timothy Michael Watson came to Windy Hill as a pimply-faced teenager in 1977. What followed was an amazing journey which should inspire thousands of young country footballers. A journey from nowhere to somewhere. The bomber from the bush left Windy Hill a champion in 1994. I'm here to tell you about the fantastic Name the Game series from Australian Football Video. Now there's over 200 games available, including final series, state games, night premierships and the best home and away matches of the 91 and 92 seasons. Not just the highlights, not just the last quarter, but a hundred minutes of top footy action. So pick up your free catalogue at any brasher store. And remember, footy brings out the best in a person.